yesterday I found myself in Holland, Michigan, on the west side of the state, about two and a half, three hours from here. Uh, my friend Atu Condoli had the opportunity to travel with me. And uh, I had the opportunity to communicate at a men's conference. And one of the gentlemen that was there to also uh, speak at this conference, uh, his name was Frank Weiser. You may have never heard of this man, but he's got an impressive resume. For 25 years, he served our country as a pilot in, in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, he now works for the Blue Angels. Anybody ever heard of the Blue Angels? They travel the country and do these different air shows. And uh, many people uh, around the world consider him to be one of the, the best pilots on the planet Earth. And uh, just recently, uh, anybody ever seen the, the new Top Gun movie? So all of the scenes where you see where it's Tom Cruise flying, it was this guy, Frank. So, so you're probably uh, familiar with the back of his head in all those scenes. And uh, so he's a born-again believer, Christ follower, and so he was communicating. And as he was talking uh, yesterday, and I, as I was listening, I thought to myself, you know, it's funny, this guy who's an amazing pilot, on the way to the conference, more than likely flew commercial. And I just had this thought in my head, what, what if, you know, this amazing pilot, as he's getting onto, you know, let's say Spirit Airlines, you know, he sees, the, he sees the, the pilots, and the pilots are like, are you Frank? You're the best pilots in the world, you know? And they're like, this is crazy, Frank's on our flight. You know, Frank's like, where's 27C, you know? So he's like going to get on the flight and everything, and I just thought of this, I was like, could you imagine if on that flight, all of a sudden these pilots, they, they begin to have turbulence and things go wrong. There is an emergency. Some of the equipment begins to fail. And, and rather than getting on the intercom, ah, could we get Frank to the cockpit? They just try to figure it out themselves and they can't seem to do it. And then the, the plane crashes and burns. It'd be what a waste. You had Frank on the flight. He, he could fly anything, but you didn't use him. As I thought about that, I thought about what I see a lot of, even within the church, is people will get married. They'll be having a difficult time in their marriage, and they forget who they have access to. If you are a Christ follower, the Bible's very clear the moment that you experience salvation, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. So I'm challenging you right now. If you're married, if you're going through some turbulence in life, would you say, Holy Spirit, be in the middle of this? God, we, we release control. We give you control. Remember who you have access to. Because I'm going to be giving you some information from God's word today, and if you're not careful, what you'll do is you'll take this information and you'll just put it here in your mind, and you'll think that you can live it out without the Holy Spirit. You can't. What I'm about to talk about is only lived out when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's why we release control to God. Because his plans are greater than ours. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we, we, we give it to him. Today, many of us, we need to allow God to change the way that we think in, in how we view this word. You ready? Love. So much of what we view as love has been tarnished by the view that culture has told you to look at love through. What lens do you view love through? Is it through culture or is it through a biblical lens, through a godly lens? 
Well, God created love. More than that, God is love. Therefore, we allow God to define what love is. I love this right here, 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. What I'm going to challenge you to do today is to ask the question, where did I get my definition of love? Because you may be getting mad at love because you've been living out the wrong definition of it. And today we're going to look at God's word and what does God have to say about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 11 gives us the definition of love. Say what? Pastor, you mean to tell me I'm 38 years old. I've been trying to figure out love, and the, and the definition was in God's word the whole time? Exactly. And at Motor City Church, we teach this in our children's ministry from the time they're this big. Because we know that if we don't, Disney will. Culture will step in and go, if you ain't going to teach them, we'll teach them. And they're going to give the wrong definition of what love actually is. So I'm challenging you today. Maybe you don't have a good understanding of what love is. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to renew and transform your mind and take on what, what love actually is? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 11. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. We're only one verse in, and some of y'all are like, that ain't culture. Verse 5 says, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. What? Yeah, yeah, you, did you catch that? Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Look, my wife and I, next month, we celebrate nine years of marriage. Shout out, shout out to Emily, yep. Now, even before that, like my wife and I started dating in high school, you know? We were 16, but we met in third grade. You want to talk about history? Oh, we could get historical. You know what I mean? My wife and I could be in the midst of an argument, talking about our finances or something, and it's tempting for one of us to be like, yeah, but you remember that one time in fourth grade you passed a note to someone else? No, we don't. Love does not keep record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Everyone say, say always. Love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes, always perseveres. Check this out. Notice how what it says always. It says it always protects, always trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Which one of those was a feeling? None of them. Culture tries to convince you that love is a feeling. And as long as I got butterflies in my belly, I'm in love. Let me tell you something. The butterflies gonna bounce. You ain't hearing me now. Because you only been dating six months and he still ain't even farted in front of you. And you're like, I'm just, so, he's perfect. He's just perfect. He, he, he's, he's everything. No, he, he's everything. And as long as you're looking for a spouse to complete you, you're going to be unfulfilled. No human can complete you. A marriage is not meant to complete your life. A marriage is meant to complement your life. Only God completes you. And as long as you're looking for a spouse to complete your life, then you're going to always have unmet expectations. You're looking at them to, to, to meet a need that they were never created and designed to be able to meet. That's a word for a single person in the room. 
Because some of you have been going, well, I can't wait till I get married so I can really have a life. No, you got a life right now. You got purpose right now. Live a Christ-centered life now. You, you don't find your purpose the moment you say, I do, uh, to a spouse. You have, you have purpose the moment you say, I do, to Christ. The moment you experience salvation, you begin to go on this beautiful journey full of purpose. So, so, so don't be looking at somebody else going, I wonder if they could complete me. They can't. They were never meant to do that. Verse 8, I love how it starts. It says, love never fails. i got to pause right there. Because as I say that, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. Some of y'all are like, I already got you, Pastor. I've I seen it fail. I, I, I've seen love. My, in my entire family, out of all my aunts and uncles and cousins, we've never had a marriage that made it past 10 years. My parents got divorced. My, my grandparents got divorced. Oh, you're going to sit here and tell me love never fails? No, it fails. No, no, no. Love never fails. How do I know that? God told me. So if, if you had what you thought was love fail, it wasn't real love. You were living out culture's definition of love. And the moment that the feelings bounced, you bounced. And so what I'm challenging you to do is to allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind. Y'all tracking with me today? So love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Verse 9, for we know in part, and, when we, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Check this out. Listen to what Paul says. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man... I put the ways of childhood behind me. Dare I say, some of you still have a childish definition of love. You still look at love from a cultural perspective, which is a fairy tale. You look at love as a Disney movie. How does the movie always end at the wedding? Why? Because culture does not have the answer to a life filled with love. They can only tell you about feelings. That's why the movie always ends right there. But if you want to have a love that is Christ-centered, that never fails, the only way that you can get the answer to that is in God's word. I almost tripped right there. I only got a few more years of that kind of athleticism. <laughs> Bro, 10 years from now, I'm going to hit that, I'm going to fall. Eric's in the back part like, don't mess up my keys now. <laughs> so, 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 verse 11, once again, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Where did you get your definition of love? And maybe today your definition of love needs the ultimate upgrade, which is the definition that God gives us for what love actually is. Paul is trying to clearly communicate to us that if you want a God-honoring and Christ-centered marriage, it's not about the power in falling in love, but rather it's the power in staying in love. Anyone can fall in love. Pastor, I fell in love. You're not going to believe. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's got... He's got money, and he's tall, dark, and handsome, and he's got, pastor, he's got a car. Does he love the Lord? Well, okay, but he grew up in church. He ain't here now. Uh, but he, had, he has a Bible verse in his Instagram bio. Let me see. Oh, it's taken out of context. <laughs> Does he live Christ-centered? Is he, let me tell you something. Ladies, write this down. Find you a man, all the single ladies in the room. Find you a man that loves the Lord more than you. I'm going to say it again. I don't know if I like that. 
oh, well, you're looking for an idol then. You're looking for someone to idolize you. No, 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 no. You want a Christ-centered marriage? Find a man, a godly man, that puts his relationship with the Lord before yours. That's what you want. That's what you need if you want to have a love that never fails. I, I, I see this a lot in our culture today. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we got a divorce. You know, we just, we just ran, out of, we ran out of love. Ran out of love? Telling me that you got a divorce because you ran out of love is like telling me that, like, you got rid of your car because it ran out of gas. Fill it up. Fill it up. It's not just about feelings. It's about living out what God has called for you to live out. Can we just get rid of that terrible excuse? We fell out of love. We, we ran out of love. When I hear that, what I hear is, no, we stopped working at it. We, 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 really, stopped, we really stopped being committed to this. We really, we really were more about ourselves than we were about serving our spouse. And let me tell you something. If you've gotten it wrong in the past, there is hope for your future. So please hear me now. This isn't like, well, I, I, w- I really wish I would have known this 20 years ago. No, 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 no. God can take the broken pieces of your past and put together a beautiful picture that will, t- that will share a testimony of God's glory and goodness in your life. So, so today, I'm not asking you to really focus on your past. I'm, I'm asking you, would you go, what are we going to do from this moment forward? Oh, man, we haven't been living this way in the past. Okay, but from this moment forward, you got a testimony to live out. We have a lot of adults in our culture today who have grown up physically, but their definition of what love looks like still looks like a child. What I want to do is I want to look at the four always that, that God tells us that love always is, And how it will lead to an incredible never, which is a love that never fails. So we're going to look at four always that will lead to an incredible never. Sometimes people are like, Pastor, great sermon. Where do you get this content? Content? Those four points came from the passage we just read. (laughs) Okay? I'm not reinventing anything. I'm telling you what God's word says. These are the four always. Love always protects. It trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. And that leads to a love that never fails. I want to break these down, though, so that way you can walk out of here with with application for how to live these things out practically in your life. The first one, love always protects. So often when I say that, um, Many people just go to the physical sense, especially the bros in the house. You know what I mean? Like you had a protein shake on the way in today. Always protects. You better believe it, pastor. Yeah, I wish somebody would look at us sideways. I wish somebody would say something to my boo. Oh, I'm going to protect her. Bro, chill, okay? Yeah, yeah, God called you to protect her physically. But he also called you to protect her spiritually. I'm not even going to go there physically because you already take jujitsu class. I want to talk about, can you protect her emotionally? Can you protect her spiritually? And hear me now, I I get it because I have conversations with people all throughout the week. Many of you did not have a good godly marriage example shown to you. But let me tell you something. That doesn't have to be your story. Many of you in this room... You will, you will be the first marriage in your family that goes the distance. I'm telling you, many of you will break generational curses that have been in your family where people just quit when times get tough. And you're going to, no, 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 no. Christ is at the center of our marriage, and we will have a testimony. We will have a marriage that impacts other people's lives. So, so don't say, well, our family is this way. No, I'm talking to you today. God's chosen you. 
to live this out. Love always protects. So how do we do that practically? I love this scripture in Philippians 4, 8, and 9. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. If you want to live this out, you got to learn to fix your thoughts. On what? What do we fix our thoughts on? On what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. If you want to have a Christ-centered marriage, you've got to first have a Christ-centered life. I've got to challenge you today. You need to know the word of God. God clearly articulates what he wants for your marriage to look like. And what I see is people go, well, you know, I kind of already know because, you know, my pastor over here taught, pastor who? Chris Harrison from the bachelor, bachelorette? He leading you astray. None of that's in God's word. And, and, it, and it's silly to laugh at, but, but you'll watch two hours of, of a show like that, but you won't spend two hours in God's word. And then you'll go, well, pastor, you know, I really just don't have the time. I'm done with that excuse. You got 24 like me. So rather than saying, well, I don't really have time to get in God's word, call it what it is. Say what, say what it really was. Today, getting in God's word was not a priority for me. Because you'll do what you prioritize. So tomorrow, don't, if, if you don't get in God's word, don't go, well, you know, I had work and I had this and just didn't have time. No, you didn't prioritize reading of God's word. Don't say I didn't have time to pray. Call it what it is. I didn't prioritize talking with God today. Man, if you want to live this out, it's not easy, but it's worth it. How do we protect our spouse spiritually? One of the best ways is through prayer. Praying for your spouse. Hey, I would be honored to pray for you and your spouse. But let me tell you something. No one can pray for your spouse the way that you can. Why? Because you know every intimate detail of your spouse. You know every nuance of what's going on in your marriage and in your lives. So yes, I would be honored to pray for you and I will do that. But if you're not praying for your spouse, you're missing it. You're missing out on your greatest prayer partner. And let me tell you something. This has blessed Emily and I because do you know how difficult it is to have a dumb argument knowing that before we go to bed in two hours, we got to hold hands and pray? You're going to be like, this is kind of lame. We shouldn't be arguing about it. This is going to be awkward. You know, we got to go before God here in a couple of hours holding hands. I mean, we might as well just go ahead and work this out. Would you pray together? If you, if, if you miss everything I say today, you just want one good practical point. If you are married, pray with your spouse tonight. And then guess what? Tomorrow, do it again. Do it again. Then do it again. And, and if God doesn't do something special in your life between now and next Sunday, come and tell me. I bet you none of you will. Never had that happen. Yeah, you know, we're praying more often. We just feel like our marriage is worse. Never met those people. Never met them. Introduce me to them. If you're like, we'll try it. And it you ain't praying to God that we're praying to. So, I, yeah, I need some application today. Go pray with your spouse. Well, I'm single. Find you somebody that lives a Christ-centered life. Begin to start praying for your future marriage. My wife is an answer to a prayer that my father prayed for 22 years. My wife and I got married at 22. My dad has journal entries that he's shown me from over the years where he was journaling, praying, God, would you bring the right spouse to my son? We're I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'll spend 
a thousand hours preparing the wedding, but an hour preparing the marriage. We've gotten it backwards in our culture. Culture's lying to you. And it leaves you empty. How do I know there's over a 50% divorce rate in our country? And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Why? Because more people are, are likely to live out what culture says than what God says. How do I know that? Well, Jesus told us the vast majority of people are on the broad path. And this right here is not taught on the broad path. You only find this on the narrow path. The life that God is calling you to live out. The, se- the second thing and third thing, I'm going to give these both at the same time. Love always hopes and love always trusts. Love always hopes and love always trusts. You know, there's some words that we find in Scripture that um, culture has tried to take and, and, and make their own. For example, this word hope, I, I've, I've come to find that most people don't have a good biblical understanding of what the, what the word hope actually means. How do I know that? Because a billion times today, people are going to be like, well, you know, I really hope that this team wins the Super Bowl. Or, you know, on your way home, you, you stop at Chipotle and you're like, man, I really hope they give me a good scoop of chicken. Oh, that's just me? Y'all ever do that? you be like, hey, can I actually get some more chicken? They're like, we're going to have to charge you extra for that. I'm like, but you gave me half a scoop. I'm, I'm just asking for the other half of the scoop. I'm getting a little sidetracked here. <clears throat> that's not a good definition of, of the word hope, biblically speaking. What does the word hope actually mean? Then? It's a constant expectation that our God is always working even when we can't sense him. That's hope. It's, yes, you understand the situation that you're in. You just got laid off from your work, and, and, and the bills are stacking up, and the money in your bank account is dwindling. But hope is going, I know that God's already gone before me. He's provided for me then. He'll provide for me now. He's still the same God. He's still Jehovah Jireh. I was never being provided for by that company anyways. It was always by the hand of God. That's biblical hope. It's an understanding that God is working on your behalf even when you don't sense him. Now, with that biblical definition, take that word hope for your marriage. Hope in your marriage is a constant expectation that my marriage is going to continue to improve, that it's going to get better, that our best days are not behind us, that are still before us. Some of you need a transforming in your mind he's always been like this he'll just continue to be like this I don't know I don't know I can't believe my mom set me up with this man right here that's not hope hope is going no hey I I know that we're not where we want to be in our marriage right now but if we can get Christ at the center of it that we can have a love that never fails you've got to have hope in your marriage. You also have to have trust. You, you, you've got to have trust. And you've got to hear me. When it comes to trust, what you have to understand is, is this. Trust in a relationship is gained in droplets, but it's lost by the bucket. And some of you are going, hey, we, we haven't had the best marriage, but we're, now we're trying to live this marriage for the Lord and put Christ at the center of all of it. And, and, and we're still, you know, trying to figure out how to have trust with one another again. Give it time. G- give it consistency. Day by day, do what you said you're going to do. You, you say, hey, I'm going to be home at work by 5 p.m. Be home at 5 p.m., not 5.45 Because once again, that was an opportunity for you to put a drop in the bucket. And the moment that you go back on your work, you just lost a bucket. So so you've got to gain trust over time with consistency and communication and care. The fourth thing that we need to do is a love always perseveres. Galatians chapter 6 verses 9 through 10. This is in the New Living Translation. It says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. There's a marriage in the room today that just needed to be reminded, don't give up. Keep going forward. 
Put Christ at the center of it. I believe that I'm telling you, after this series, we're going to hear testimonies months from now, years from now, where people are going to say, hey, wait, we made a decision in that time in February of 2024 to really put Jesus at the center of it. And, and I know we looked like we had it all together, but we didn't. But over the past several years, God has done some healing and restoration in our marriage. It's only when you do it God's way. You can keep doing relationships and marriage culture's way, but don't get mad at God when it, you get what culture gives. Death and destruction. Some of you have been fooled. As I was listening to this gentleman yesterday, Frank, speak, he talked about how as he flies these planes, they would land on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. This thing's like a quarter mile long. Imagine a boat that's like a quarter mile. And, 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 and so they would fly in at about 250 miles per hour to land, and, and he would talk about how difficult it was as, as the, the boat would be rocking in, in the ocean. And he said, you know, one of the things that we had to do was land at night, and it was very difficult because there was no lights on the boat. He said because oftentimes we would be just offshore from an enemy, and we didn't want them to, to see what was actually there. He said we actually had this technology on the bottom of this quarter mile boat at the bottom we had lights that would light up to make it appear in the darkness of the sea that it was just a 30 foot sailboat i thought that's the same tactic that the enemy uses in the dark you're looking oh look at that cute look at that cute little 30 foot sailboat but what you don't see in the darkness is a warship ready to destroy your marriage what does John 10.10 10 say? Jesus says the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. So rather than living this out culture's way, we go, no, no, no. I believe that God's way works. And let me tell you something. Oftentimes what the enemy will use as a tactic is addition. What did we say? Love always protects. Love always hopes. Love always trusts. Love always perseveres. And you know what the enemy comes along and says? And. The enemy doesn't want you to have these just four definitions. The enemy says, love, I'll give you 34. Oh, yeah, you want love? You can sleep with who you want to sleep with. Oh, you could do what you want to do. And, and they'll try to, the enemy will try to add an and. There's, there's, there's no and here. This is God's definition. Don't try to add something to God's word that is not there. God's word does not need a revision. God's word is the truth. And you're, here's the thing. You're going to learn that one of two ways. One, you'll live it out. And you'll go, God's word was, it's so true. Or you'll figure it out through a word called regret. choice is yours. I can do what I want to do. I can marry whoever I want to marry. Yeah, God gave you a beautiful gift called free will. What will you do with it? Will your pride and lustful desires take hold of that? Or will you submit all of your life to the Lord and say, no, 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 no. We want to do this God's way the choice is yours I'm challenging our church stop looking for the fairy tale and begin to look for what God gives us a love that never fails as Frank uh, was talking about that aircraft carrier that he would have to land a plane on he talked about how there would be about a thousand people on the ship and as they would land it, it was part of their policy that the vast majority of the crew had to watch the landing. He said, so you get a, a grade on every landing. He, he landed hundreds and hundreds of times on this aircraft carrier in the middle of the sea. And he said, you would get a grade. It would be either A, B, C, D, and I was like, or F. And then he didn't say F. He said, you'd get an A, B, C, D, or 
nice correction. He said, sometimes as you were landing on the plane, the plane on this aircraft, the, the, the waves would be so crazy and you wouldn't do it just right, but you would make the correct correction. And so your grade would be nice correction. I believe that's the word that God is trying to speak over some of your lives today. Because you know that you've made mistakes in your past. And he's telling you, hey, today you have the opportunity to make a nice correction. What's the correction? It's called repentance. You were going in one direction. The word repentance is in the original language. It's actually a military term. And it means to do an about face, a 180. So as they were marching, they would repent. They would stop going in the direction that they were going. They would do an about face, a repentance, and they would begin to go the other direction. Many of you need to do that in your life today. You're going down the broad path, the, the trick of the enemy, and you're going this way, and you're like, I'm going to do relationships and marriage the way I want to do it. I'm going to fulfill every lustful desire I have. And God's saying there's a better way. Would you listen to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit and repent Turn from the old way you were doing things and go in the direction of God. That is where you'll find love that never fails. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your word and your truth. God, the reason that we can experience a love that never fails is because of your faithfulness and your love that has never failed. God, your love in Scripture is laid out to us in this word called agape. It means that you love us unconditionally. No matter our past mistakes, the Bible says that God has an, an agape love for you. It's a, it's a love that means that God doesn't, couldn't love you any more or any less based off of what you've done. He just loves you so much. And he desires to be in relationship with you. But the problem is, is that you and I, we have been infected with a disease called sin. You and I, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And because God loves you so much and his love never fails, he sends his one and only son, Jesus, from heaven to earth to live the perfect and holy life that you and I could never live apart from him. He lives a holy life. He dies on a cross, taking the punishment for your sin and for mine. He was placed in a tomb and three days later he rose again, conquering and defeating death. So that way if you would put your faith in him, you could be saved by his grace. That is the gospel. Don't allow the trick of the enemy to add an and. Well, and you you got to you got to serve a certain amount of hours at church and you got to give a certain amount of money. No, 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 no. That is called religion. Religion is spelled D O do. A relationship with Christ is is spelled D O N E. The work has already been done. The price has already been paid. All there is to do is to receive his forgiveness. Today, I'm not asking you if you grew up in church. If you did, that's awesome. Today, I'm not asking you if you have a Bible verse in your Instagram bio. If you do, that's awesome. I want to be very clear what I'm asking. I'm not asking you if you've got somebody in your family that's in ministry. If you do, that's cool. That's awesome. If your uncle's a deacon or an elder, whatever the case may be. But the thing is, God doesn't save last names. He saves first names. The decision that your grandmother made to receive Christ did not save you. It saved her. God gives you this beautiful gift of free will to either receive him or reject him. There is no middle ground when it comes to the gospel. There's no partially saved. You have either received salvation or you have not. And you're actively rejecting God with your life. Where are you? I can't answer that question for you. That's, that's between you and God. 
I mean, I can see, as the word says, the fruit in your life or not. But today, God's brought you here for a purpose, and I believe it's to have an encounter with him. Before God laid the foundations of earth, he knew you'd be sitting in that plastic chair in a CrossFit gym in downtown Detroit in February of 2024. And his heart's desire, as, as the word of God says, is that it is God's desire to see everyone saved. But not everyone will. Many will be the God of their own life. They'll do things that, the way they want to do it. But as Pastor Eric brilliantly said earlier, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that God, Jesus, is the Lord of lords. He's the King of kings. The question then becomes, not will you say that. The question is, when will you say it? On this side of eternity or the other? If you say it on this side of eternity, you give your life to the Lord and you'll spend your eternity with him. But the Bible's very clear. If you reject God on this side of eternity, he'll give you a greater measure of that. An eternity separate from the presence of God. The choice is yours. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Don't wait, young person. Give your life to the Lord today. Live a life filled with purpose, not regret. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now, and if, if that's you... You know who you are because you, you sense it on the inside. That's not, that's not just feelings. That's the Holy Spirit knocking at the door of your soul. The question is, will you receive him or turn him away? If you want to give your life to the Lord today, you can do it right now. Say, God, forgive me of my sins. I, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. God, because you know my heart better than I know my own heart, you know that I still have questions and doubts. But the beautiful thing is, is that your word says that if I could have the faith the size of a mustard seed, I could be saved. So what I'm, I'm encouraging you to do today is put your faith that you do have right now in Jesus. Say, Jesus, to the best of my ability, I believe that you are who you say that you are. I believe that you died on the cross to take the punishment of my sins, that you were placed in a tomb and rose again. And right now, I give my life to you. God, would you make me new? I receive your forgiveness, grace, and mercy as I place my faith in you and in you alone. God, make me new. If you just made that decision, it's not just a prayer, it's a decision. It's the greatest decision that you could ever make in your life. It's a decision that will impact not just the 70, whatever odd years you have here on earth, but it'll affect a trillion years from now. You're more than just a body, you're a soul that will live on for eternity. God, before we end in prayer, God, I just want to ask that for every marriage that's represented in the room, God, that as we walk out of these doors, God, that we would have a, a good biblical, godly perspective of hope and that we would have hope for our marriage, that our best days are before us, not because of what we can do, not because of new information, but because we are allowing you, Lord, to transform us from the inside out. I pray that today decisions would be made in marriages that have not been living Christ in their lives, that they would have the difficult and uncomfortable conversations to say, hey, can we both just acknowledge the fact we have not been doing this God's way, but from this moment forward, we're putting Christ at the center of all that we do, and I pray that in the future that you have the opportunity to share with other young couples that, hey, God's way works. We've tried it every other way. It leaves you empty. But God's way works. God, I pray for healing and restoration in marriages in this room right now. That we would leave better than we came in. God, that we would put you at the center of it all. God, we love you so much and we thank you. We praise you. It's in your son's name. Amen.